Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, go to John chapter 3 and verse 16. Tonight, we're going to be talking about God's great gift of love. I have been preaching, which is hard for me to believe, for nearly 10 years now. And, uh, and, and in the nine and a half years or so that I have been preaching, I have never preached John 3.16, which is kind of hard to believe. Now, I've referenced it, obviously. Uh, but it is a, a great verse of Scripture that I thought would be appropriate for this time of year because it's, uh, it's about you know, giving and receiving and, and God's great gift of love to us in the form of His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, throughout the years of the holiday season, many gifts have been given and received during this time of year. Some of these gifts, let's say many of the gifts, have been wonderful, exciting, joyful gifts that we were so glad to receive, like that Red Rider BB gun with the compass in the stock, you know. Uh, amen. But then again, over the years, there have been a lot of gifts that were pretty lousy. And let, let's, let's face it, there's been a lot of gifts that have been given to us that we've either forgotten about or we tried to re-gift to somebody we didn't care for the next year. Everybody's got that gift that keeps, that keeps on giving. And here's another example. I've got a picture up here of a lousy gift. See that? Y'all recognize? That's a lousy gift. Now, if you're a grandma and you're making one of those for your grandson, that's a lousy gift. I just want to tell you right now. Nobody wants that gift. Now, I told you this morning. Now, this is, this is informal Christmas Eve Eve, Brother Matt's version of church service. And so... I told you we're going to have a little competition tonight about uh, who has the lousiest gift story. And I, I want to hear these. I want to share some lousy gift stories with you, okay? And I, I have multiple lousy gift stories. I'm just going to dip in the bag and grab one because over the years I have been given several lousy gifts. Um, but I, I want to share my wife's and then I'll share mine. And, and I'm pretty sure my wife's will win. But I, I can't wait to hear somebody out here who's brave enough to tell me about their lousiest gift. My wife's mother, and I had to get her permission to, to share this story. So I, I do have her permission, by the way. My, my wife's mother died a week before Christmas in 1993 when my wife was 13 years old. And a, a few days before Christmas, uh, they're having her funeral. And her, great, her aunt at the time, and by the way... It, it, it's always the rich people who get you lousy gifts, by the way, just for the record, all right? Her aunt, who is well-to-do, she's telling her, she said, listen, I drew your name for Christmas, and uh, I've got you this wonderful gift, and I, I can't wait to give it to you. And she said, you know, in the midst of all of your sadness, I, I want to give you this gift early uh, so that you can have some cheer in your life because of the dark circumstances. So she's really building this gift up as if she's gotten her some great gift, you know, like, uh, like she's got the key, like she's going to throw her the keys any minute. You know, I've got, I've got you this wonderful gift. And Karen said, well, I can't imagine what this is that she thinks is going to cheer me up after my mother just died. And she opens it up, and her well-to-do aunt had gotten her a hair clip for Christmas. A hair clip. That's, that's a pretty lousy gift. I, I, you know what? I would probably take that gift and throw it at her and say, that gift is so good, you wear it. That's a lousy gift, especially after you build it up. Now, I want to tell you about a gift I got one time that I didn't care for. Now, there was a day, and you may not be able to know this now, there was a day when I was athletic. James, you, you, there, you don't know me in these days. But there was a day when I was athletic. And I love sports. I played sports all my life. And uh, I, I go to Christmas. I was about eight or nine years old. Now, this was a kick in the face right here. And uh, the night before, they're going to let you open one gift. But, of course, the gift they let you open the night before really isn't that great of a gift anyway, right? And so they're like, hey, everybody gets to open one gift. Well, I have my cousin there who was a nerd, didn't even like sports. And he opens up his gift, and it's a pair of OU pajamas. And I thought, hey... Hot dogs from OU pajamas. And he's, as he's sliding into his OU pajamas, and I am eagerly tearing the paper away to get my OU pajamas, which have lost their luster by now anyway. Amen, OSU fans. 
And so as I'm tearing into this, and my eyes are expecting to see Oklahoma pajamas. And instead, I got Smurf pajamas. I know how Ralphie feels. And I thought to myself, there must be a mistake. They must have switched our boxes. Because, and not to make it all worse, they, they put him in his pajamas, hoist him up on their shoulders, dance him around the house singing Boomer Sooner, while I am left to deal with the tragedy that's just taken place in my life. I'm still pretty bitter about it. It's been nearly 30 years. I, I'm, I'm pretty bitter about it. I ain't going to lie to you. That's a lousy gift. Nobody wants Smurf pajamas. I've actually gotten gifts that probably were worse than that, but didn't sting as bad. That, that one stung pretty bad. Uh, you know, I got a, a creamer set one time, a cow-shaped creamer set. And that, that, was, that was horrible. Why anybody would even give that? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. If you're giving that. So I want to hear somebody beat my pajama story or Kara's hair clip story. Come on. Somebody give me a lousy gift. Somebody participate. Come on, Betty West. You'll, you'll speak up. You gotta, what did Dwight get you last year that was so bad? <laughs> no way. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, you're 15, yeah. yeah. That'll learn you. That'll break you from sucking eggs, won't it, right there? Sneaking into the, to the presents. I'll get you a lousy gift. Yeah, it's, yeah, you're 15 years old. A Barbie doll's not that great. <laughs> hey, Shelby, it's the same one. Anybody else? Come on, there, there's got to be lousier gifts than that. Come on. All right, James, tell us about your lousy gift. Um, this is really from a long point of view, but uh, you love to crochet and knit. And, all that <laughs> and uh, for Christmas, um, I opened up a box and she had crocheted you some booties. All right. <laughs> she crocheted you some booties? Yes, sir. <laughs> but you were 21, right? <laughs> Hey don't, hey, don't let him fool you. He, he wore them off to the Marines a while back. Anybody else want to share? Come on, this is fun Christmas Eve, Eve night. Come on. Sam, let's hear it. Come on. <laughs> that is awesome. I wish I'd have thought of that two days ago. It would have saved me a lot of money. That's good. A picture of a bicycle. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a stinger. Way to go, Brother Sam. Thank you for that. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift cometh down from above. And when we think about the greatest gift of all, no gift has been given that has ever been greater than the gift that God gave us in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. John 3, 16. Now, the, John chapter 3 begins. That chapter begins with a religious man who knows the law of God, who thinks himself to be very self-righteous, but he is seeking something he's seeking an encounter with god but not a religious encounter he wants to seek a real encounter with god you know you know not, not everything that is religious necessarily is good not everything that is spiritual necessarily is good 
But this man wanted to have a real encounter with God. Nicodemus was searching. And Jesus tells Nicodemus that he must be born again. And then he highlights this chapter with what is known as the greatest verse in all of the Bible. It's known as the hub of the Bible. John Phillips said that the text itself revolves around ten words. God loved world, gave son, whosoever believeth perish, have life. And he goes on to say that those ten words make up the constellation of the Redeemer in the firmament of divine revelation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not a greater verse has ever been spoken or ever been penned. And around this one verse revolves all the other verses. It is the verse that everybody has to deal with. It's the verse that every believer knows and every non-believer must deal with. And there are four simple things I want us to note very quickly tonight about God's great gift of love. Notice, first of all, the depth of God's great love. There's an obvious emphasis on the word love in the phrase by Jesus when he says, For God so loved. What makes the love of God so great is that it's not like the love of the world. So often I've shared with you that, that God's love is not like worldly love. A few weeks ago I asked you when I spoke about God's great forgiveness. I said, aren't you glad that God doesn't forgive like man forgives? Because man says, oh yeah, I forgive you. And then the emotions come back up. Every time the subject's brought up, the, the old harbored emotion comes back with it and we can get angry again. But when God forgives you, he forgives it and he forgets it. And it's buried. But aren't you glad that God, do, that man, uh, God doesn't love like man loves? Man's love is oftentimes conditional and easily dismissed, but the love of God is not based on our pleasing Him, but He so loves because His love is based on our preciousness to Him. You see, it's not based on pleasure, it's based in preciousness. Because we don't always please God. Not all the time do, we, our, do our lives reflect what God wants it to reflect. Not all the time do we do the things that we ought to do that ought to please God and make Him happy with us. But God's love is not based upon our pleasing Him. It's based upon our preciousness to Him. And He loves us so much that He gave His Son for us. God loves, God loves the unlovable. He so loves that He loves people who are not even Lovable. I love what Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 say. It says it like this. And you hath he quickened. Now listen to whom God is loving and God is saving. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. That's who he's loving. According to the prince of the power of the air... The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of, the, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature the children of wrath even as others. This is how God so loves, because he loves the unlovable. And then it goes on to say, but God. Two of the best words in all the Bible, but God. Over and over and over, we see these two words linked together. And behind these two words come great words of pardon and relief and love and mercy. But God, even though we were in our flesh, even though we walked according to our flesh, fulfilling the lust thereof, even though we were dead in trespasses and sins, even though we were the children of disobedience and the children of wrath, but God, who is rich in mercy... For his great love wherewith he loved us. Boy, I like that verse. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Made us, together, made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The depth of his love. He so loves. And he loves people who are unlovable. Notice, secondly, the direction of God's great love. For God so loved the world. What is amazing to me is that the great love of God is aimed at the heart of a world and it is directed at the heart of men who do not love him. Now, the Bible says that we love him, but why? Because he first loved us, right? The direction of God's great love is toward a world and towards men who did not love him. God so loved the world. And then the question here is what does the Bible say about the world's response to the love that God has shown them? Our response to his love sometimes is, is not very warm. The Bible says this. It says, and John, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. He was rejected by this world. The world that he directed his love at is the same world that rejected him, didn't know him, wouldn't receive him. God's love through the great gift of Jesus was aimed at a dying, immoral, hopeless, blaspheming world that ultimately rejected his love. Yet he directed it at those he knew would not love him. One of the writers that I was reading this week, Max Lucado, was talking about how the world responds to the love of God. He said, it's kind of like how my old dog, Salty, responds to our love. He's blind and half crippled and can't hear very good. And anytime you reach out to touch him, to show him any affection, he just snarls at you and growls. And, and it's unfortunate, but... There's, this world does not understand a God who loves them so much. And even though he has directed and aimed his love at them, they reject him. Even after the imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually, God loved the world. Even after Israel rejected God's plan, complained against his leaders, and continually, continually turned to idolatry. Even though they did all that, God still loved the world. Even the people who rejected his prophets and his word, he still loved them. For God so loved the world. And he proved it by giving his son. The beauty of God's love is that it knows no boundaries. It's directed at a world that hates him, but it knows no boundaries. It's extended to everyone individually. It is extended to everyone internationally, regardless of your race or social status. Uh, God's great gift of love brings redemption to all mankind. He loves everyone. He loves everyone equally. The Bible says in Romans 5, 18, a, a great verse. It says, therefore, as by the offense of one Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. There's the whole world being judged because of our sin. But he says, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift, the free gift came upon all men to justification. God's great love is directed at all men everywhere. He's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Here's what's amazing about his love still yet is that even while people are hating him today and blaspheming in his name and rejecting his word today, God still loves the world. Isn't that amazing? What's amazing is that the Christians of today can't stand the world, but God still loves them. We look around in great judgment and God is going to judge, but God still looks around in great mercy and love. God loves a world that hates him. See, how do you know that God loves this world? Well, it's pointed out in our next point. Notice, thirdly, the demonstration of God's great love. 
You see, real love always moves to action. Words are cheap. God's love is not cheap in empty words <clears throat> like the love of man often is, but God's love is filled with promise and it is backed up by his actions. You've heard the expression that actions speak louder than words. Our wives don't want us to tell them how much we love them. They want us to show them how much we love them. And that's exactly what God did. He demonstrated his love. The love of man is so often superficial, yet the love of God is ultimately sacrificial. He loved enough to give. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the demonstration of his love. Enough said. <clears throat> There's no greater demonstration than that. There's no greater demonstration of love than to give yourself for somebody or to give your son for somebody. Love doesn't get any greater than that. Now let me ask you this. How many of you, how many of you, let's say that Osama bin Laden is still alive and he's on trial for the evil, heinous crimes that he has done. How many of you would give your son to die in his place so that he could have pardon and go free? How about the men, these boys that do these school shootings? If they were still alive, how many of you would allow your son or yourself to die in the place of one of these people so that they could go free and say, well, Brother Rains, they're guilty. Hey, so are we. So are we. The only difference between us and anybody else who walks the streets is we are sinners saved by grace. The demonstration of God's love is this, that the people that we would not die for and would not let our children die for, those people God let his son die for. And such were some of you, is what the Apostle Paul would say. What's amazing about it is people like that who we think are so undeserving of the love and grace of God, God let his son die for those people. And I pity him. I pity people who will never know the great gift of God's love. He demonstrated it by giving his life. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, I love this verse. But God commendeth his love toward us. God proved his love. Demonstrated his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible also says in John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friend. And the Bible goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say, that no man takes his life, but he lay it down freely of himself. What a demonstration of love. You know, for all the lousy gifts that we've been given, it gets quite easy to count your blessings when you think about the greatest gift of all, doesn't it? You know, <clears throat> those lousy Smurf pajamas, I don't know what happened to those things. And I'm glad they're gone. <laughs> Sam probably doesn't still have his picture of his bicycle he wanted. The booties James still has. I don't care what he says. He still has those. But all of those things, all of those gifts, even the good ones don't matter. I've gotten great gifts. I've gotten lousy gifts, but no gift compares to the gift that God has given in his son, Jesus Christ. And when we focus on that gift, all these other gifts take their place where they belong. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says this, In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Here's the demonstration of God's love toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. The demonstration of God's great love. He sent his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want you to think about one last thing before we close. The dynamic of God's great love. He ends that verse by saying this. Here's the dynamic. That whosoever 
believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the great dynamic behind it all is that if we believe and accept the gift of God's Son, Jesus, we can have everlasting life, we can have abundant life. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Not only do we have this opportunity to be saved in Christ Jesus through this great sacrifice and this great gift of God, but this is the only way by which man can be saved. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not only is God's gift of love so great, but there is no other gift like it. No other gift like it. None that matches its dynamic. None that can do what it does. None that can reach as far as it has reached. It is truly a gift that keeps on giving. How blessed we are to have a loving and merciful God who gives good gifts. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Tonight, I want to ask you, if you're a Christian and you've received this great gift of love, do you have a heart of gratitude for it? I think so often we take for granted what we've been given by God through Christ Jesus. I think so often we can overlook it and, and kind of get used to it. That I've been saved. And, but tonight, would you do me a favor? Would you make sure that your Christmas is not about what, what this world makes it about? Would you make sure that your Christmas is about thanking God for his great gift of love? Tonight, if there's one with us who's never received God's great gift of love, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me, let me encourage you to accept it. You see, Jesus Christ died for everyone. God so loved the world. And Jesus died for everyone. But just because Jesus died for everyone doesn't mean that everyone's going to heaven. As much as I would love for that to be the case, it's not true. God's great gift is still just that. It's a gift. And it must be accepted. And many people reject God's love. Many people have rejected God's gift of Jesus Christ. And friends, I want to encourage you tonight, if you've never accepted Christ as Savior, don't reject his love. Embrace him. Embrace the gift that God has given. What a shame. What a shame for it to go to waste. When God has loved you so much, would you come and give your heart to him tonight? Maybe would you come and say, thank you, Lord, for all your love. We're going to stand together, have a song of invitation. As our musicians come,